I'm in Minitab with the height, Hong Kong height and weight data set open. Uh, when we looked at this before, looking at confidence intervals, we were looking at what happens when we take different samples from the population. We had a whole lot of columns here, and you can just delete all of those. Just select, just select them all and press delete like that. Um, and so you only really need one column of heights and one column of weights, and I believe the sample size is 100. And we're looking at regression, and the idea is can we use one variable to predict or explain the other variable? So I'd usually start off with a graph of, of some sort, and in this case it would be a scatter plot. Now up till now we've just looked at simple scatter plots, but now we might want to choose the one with the regression line added in. Now the y variable is typically the response variable, and in that case it would be the weight, and the x variable would be the predictor variable, which is the height. So this says that we're using height to predict weight. Um, and this is more of a convention than anything else. It actually won't change the uh, it won't change the output of the regression. It just depends which one you want to use to predict the other, and we'll have a look at that when we look at the actual equations. Now if we go into the data view, we can see that it will do different types of regression and in this case we want to stick with the linear regression and fit the intercept. And that should be the default, so you shouldn't need to pick anything there. Now we can see that there does appear to be a trend that as people get taller, they also get heavier. And this hopefully makes a bit of sense and we would expect to see this type of relationship. However, we can see that there is a lot of scatter around this line. So it's not a perfect prediction. There's other things going on which affect people's weight rather than just their height. So this is a very, very simple model. Now to perform the regression analysis, we go to stat regression. And just this top one is fine. Just regression. This is simple linear regression. So our response variable is the weight, because we believe that weight is responding to the height, and so the predictor variable is height. Now we're only doing simple regression with one predictor variable. You actually can put more in here if you want to. Um, we're just going to stick with one. Graphs. Now this is where we get to pick what we want to do for looking at the residuals. Now I think it's easiest um, pick the standardised residuals and the 4-in-1 plot really is quite handy to look at. When you have more complicated models you might want to look at the residuals versus each of the variables but as we only have one variable this 4-in-1 plot is fine. Okay. So sometimes I actually look at the residuals before I even look at the output of the analysis because if something goes wrong with the residuals then the analysis is basically useless anyway. It's not going to tell me anything. So I'm looking for a few things here. So if I look at these in the order that I, I wrote some of the assumptions down for the simple linear regression in the worksheet, the first one we have there is that the variables are linearly related and this means can we fit reasonably fit a straight line through the relationship or does it really need to have a curve in it? Now in this case the straight line looks fine. There's a whole lot of scatter here but it doesn't actually look like it should in fact be a curved line. So we can look at that at the scatter plot and we can also see that um, in this fitted value versus the standardised residuals. If Often the curved relationship will show up more clearly in this plot than it will in the scatter plot. So if you start to see the dots falling in some kind of pattern here, it usually means there's a relationship that we haven't adequately described. What we want to see is just random scatter. And that's pretty much what we've got here. Um, we also want to know that the errors are independent of each other. And so for that we're also looking to see that the um, the residuals are randomly scattered around. If you see any patterns come out in either the uh, fitted value versus the standardised resi residuals or even the standardised residuals in the observation order, it might indicate that there is some relationship between the observations that's not being accounted for. In this case everything looks fine. Our other assumption is that the 
residuals are normally distributed and we can see that in both these plots. We've got a normal probability plot. If the residuals are normal then they should fall along this blue line. So this blue line gives you a bit of a guide. Now this is not perfect. We can see we've got one observation down on the lower end that's pulling the line out from the blue line and we've got another one up here. It is possible to run a, a test on this to get a p-value out if you want to but for this um, subject I'm happy for you just to look at the probability plot and if you're not sure how to read this then you can confirm what you're looking at with the histogram below and you should be familiar with what a normal distribution looks at looks like now and you can see that we do have this one large residual at, at the bottom end but overall this is fairly normal so I would be fine with that. Um, I skipped over the errors having constant variance. This is perhaps the most difficult one to understand and it's easier to see it in an, in an example where it goes wrong. So we'll look at that for another data set. And what that means is, is it's another thing where we're looking to see other, other errors randomly scattered or is there more variation at one end of the spectrum than the other. So what can happen is that you have very little variation with the smaller values and then a lot of value, a lot of variation with the higher values and you get this kind of funneling out uh, pattern. Now if we didn't have these data, mm, no this looks, we've got a low patch here where we don't have many, as many short people but there doesn't seem to be any tendency for increasing variance so I would be okay with this in this case and we'll look at an example where it's very clear that we've got the variance increasing. So overall I'm quite happy with these residuals. Um, and then I'll go on to look at the output. So for Minitab, if I just extend this out, it gives us first uh, the regression equation. So it says weight is equal to minus 110 plus 3.51 times the height. So that means if you want to predict someone's weight based on their height, you put their height in here and then you just calculate out this equation which uh, the computer will also do for you if you want it to predict certain values. So that's the equation it's fitted. Now if you put your variables in the opposite way, your, um, your other output will all be just about the same, it's just that the regression equation will be the other way around. So the one you want to predict is goes on, should be on the left and then the one you're using to predict it should be on the right. So we've got a couple of hypotheses here. The one we're most interested in is the one for height. Now the hypothesis being tested here, and you can see that it's a t-test because it says t up the top here, is that the slope of the line or the coefficient for height, that's the 3.51, is equal to zero. The p-value here is very small, which is very strong evidence against the slope being zero. And a zero slope would mean that there was no relationship between the two. That's what it would indicate. So we've got very strong evidence against the null hypothesis and therefore there is a relationship between weight and height. The other thing that we're very interested in is this R squared. And we're going to look at the adjusted value. Um, it's usually fairly similar to the R squared value. It just makes a small adjustment depending on your sample size. So if you have a very small sample size, it'll drop down a bit. The R squared adjusted value tells us the amount of variation in the data that we can explain with our model. So we can explain about 27% of the variation in weights based on height which is okay for such a simple model, it's not huge, um, but we wouldn't expect it to be really high because we should know that there are a lot of factors which influence weight other than just your height. So we, we would be, I would be very surprised if we got anything higher than that for this type of model. The analysis of variance you can just skip. There is another p-value here and uh, an f-statistic which goes with ANOVA and this is just testing the significance of the model overall but if you have a significant variable here this will turn out to be significant anyways so I, I don't think it's important that you look at that. The last thing we have here are unusual observations. Sometimes it's worth investigating the unusual observations and sometimes you just have ones which don't fit well into the model and that just might be due to random variation or other things we haven't uh, modelled. So it's worth looking at these but you don't really need to do anything with them. So there's nothing particularly 
wrong with this model. This is a fairly straightforward one. The residuals look fine, your predictor is significant, you have a reasonable R squared. There are some unusual observations. Um, I don't know that there's anything that we would do about them, mostly because we don't know how the data was collected, so we would have no reason to exclude any of these data points. What I'd like to do now is look at a different data set where things start to go a little bit wrong. Um, and we've got, this is the car data set where we're looking at the original price of cars and then what they get advertised for for resale. Now there are other variables here and we're just going to look at these two here. So we can start with again with a scatter plot regression. Now our response is going to be the advertised price and we're going to use the original price of the car to explain that response. And if you remember from when we looked at this data set before, we had a couple of unusual observations and these were the prestige cars that were actually bought really, really cheaply um, but then presumably restored and sold for phenomenally high prices. So we might expect that these two data points are going to cause us issues with the regression and these might be data points that we exclude simply because they don't fit with the rest of the data. The rest of the data are about regular cars being used in regular ways and these two cars were bought specifically to uh, to do up and sell for a, a high value. They're prestige cars so they're, they're a different type of car from the rest of the cars and that would be a good reason for excluding them if they start to cause problems. We can't just exclude them because they don't fit with the model for no other reason but if, they're, if they are actually of a different type and there's something going on here then that's a reason to exclude them. So if I go to stat regression, I'm going to do the same thing as before. The response is the advertised price and the predictor is the original price. The graphs, again, the standardised and the 4-in-1. OK. Now there's a couple of problems we can see here. Now I can see the increasing variance here, but this might not be obvious to you. Uh, and one of the reasons that it's not very obvious is we have these two, um, oh, I moved that around, we have these two extreme observations. It should be fairly clear that this, that these residuals are not normal either. This is a very strong curve in, and it should be a straight line on top of the blue line. If we look at the histogram, we can see that although it's sort of bell-shaped, it's actually pulled up too high in the middle, it's too peaked. Uh, and this is, you can measure this with kurtosis if you're interested. So what I would do with this, if we look at the output, it will also tell us, um, it will tell us the extreme observations and the one I'm interested in here are the last two, 8.17 and 8.18. Very large standardised residuals. There's a few other, well, there's quite a lot of unusual observations, but these are the two which I think are causing us the biggest problems. Now if you hover over the graph, it's popping up on the side outside the capture window at the moment, but on your screen if you hover over it, it should tell you which row number they are. That one's showing up as row 818, and this one is showing up as uh, 817, so that's the last two in the data set. So although there are other unusual observations in here which may also be causing issues, I have no reason to exclude them because as far as I know they are regular cars which were just bought and resold. And I'm going to go down to here and I'm just going to always keep a backup of your data when you start messing around with it. I'm actually just going to delete these. Now I'm going to run the same analysis again. Hopefully the options are the same. Okay, okay. So now we still have the same problem with the non-normality. We still have this fairly strong curve here. And this is again caused, I think, by these very expensive cars. Um, but now this problem of increasing variance hopefully is more clear. So what we can see is that there's a very small amount of variation at the low end and the variation is fanning out. And this is called increasing variance or heteroscedatic heteroscedastic variance um, and we want our variance to be constant or homoscedastic. Um, so this is another thing that if you were doing a more advanced analysis we might try and fix some of these problems with the transformation of the data but we're not going to in this case. It's okay just to comment on these. 
if we go back and look at the analysis now, we can see that the, we have our regression equation. The original price is a highly significant predictor of the advertised price. We have a p-value of 0 0.000. The null hypothesis is that the coefficient is zero. We've got strong evidence against that and therefore the coefficient of original price is probably not zero. Our r-squared adjusted is 71%, which is really high, so we're explaining 71% uh, of the variation in advertised price with our model based on original price, which is quite a lot. If you scroll up and have a look at the r-squared adjusted with our previous model, it was only 60%. So this is saying we're getting a much better fit for the model. We're explaining a lot more of the variation without having those prestige cars in it. We do still have all these unusual observations which might be worth looking at. I don't know if there's something else going on here. So that's one thing that can go wrong with regression and at this stage we're just commenting on it. If we can fix it with, with deleting just a couple of observations we might do that but we won't be going any further into transformations. The last data set that we'll have a look at is on bouncing golf balls. So this was a nice project and they actually, the whole data set is much, much bigger than this. They bounced a lot of different balls on a lot of different um, surfaces. But as we're only doing a simple analysis, I really just wanted to look at one of the things that went on. If we do a graph, a scatter plot, what I'm interested in is the time until the ball stopped bouncing, which is the time to rest, based on the first rebound height. And we would expect that if the first rebound height is very high, that it's going to bounce for longer. That, to me, would make uh, a lot of sense. And we can see that does indeed happen. If the first rebound height is fairly low, then it doesn't bounce for quite as long. When the first rebound height is really high, then it bounces for longer. So this makes a lot of sense to me. If we go into our regression regression, the response is the time to rest and the predictor is the rebound height. Graphs, everything pops up on the other screen, I can't fix that. Standardised, 4 in 1, okay, okay. Now this does not look good. So the residuals actually don't look independent of each other. We've definitely got some grouping going on here. They don't look randomly scattered around. The residuals are mostly low at this end, then they go up and then they go down. So to me that says there is a pattern there. Now the pattern in this case you can sort of see from the original scatter plot. They're, low, they're below the regression line, then they're above the regression line, and then they're below again. But it just pops out a little bit more clearly when you have a look at the residuals. And what this is showing me is that a straight line is probably not the best line to fit to this data. I think it needs a bit of a curve in it. It needs to go down a little bit here, it needs to go up a little bit and down a bit. So we want a curvy line, not a straight line. And the other problem this is having is that the residuals are not quite normal. Now this is a small data set because I've only just looked at the golf balls bouncing on concrete, we're down to 20 observations. So this is not a huge data set. So if this was the only problem with the data then I probably wouldn't be too worried about it. But because we've got this distinct curved line here, I would say that simple linear regression is not appropriate in this case. It's actually not that hard to fix. I'll show you how to draw a picture of what the curved regression would look like. We go into data view, regression, we can get it to draw what's called a quadratic curve. And I think this is going to fit the data much better. So tick quadratic, OK, OK. And you can see now that it's going through the data points much more nicely. And if we ran a regression with this line, it would come out um, as a much better fit. If we look at the linear regression where we fit a straight line to it, you can see that it still comes out as significant. We still have a zero p-value here and we still have a really high r-squared. So it's not that this model is no good, it's just it really could be better because it's 
the relationship doesn't look like a straight line, it looks like a curved line. Now if we fit that curved line in, uh, this R squared jumps up to I think 97% when I ran it. So it made it a much, much better model. So if you see this type of data in your project, um, then ask me for help and I will help you generate this extra column to get the curve in there. Uh, this is just the square of the, the rebound heights. It's not that hard to do. If I add that in and then run the regression, I might as well do it seeing as it's there. It means we want to fit the straight line relationship in, but we also want to fit these curved bits in too. Now the residuals look better. They do, they're do they not perfectly normal, but they look better than they did before. And you can see that the R squared, oh, it hasn't gone up to 97, it's gone up to 93. So it has still increased by, what, 5 or 6% and um, both the predictors are significant. So you don't have to go this far. It's, I'm only mentioning it because if you do get this showing up in your project, it's really quite simple to fix and it's worth having a look at it if you get the chance.